the Paul Leslie interviews. Well, the man I'm talking to is Ed Murray. He's a retired financial consultant, the inspiration for the film Caddyshack, and an inductee of the Western Golf Association's Caddy Hall of Fame. So, how are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you for for asking, Paul. Oh, it's great. So, you were named for someone. I was named after my uh, dad and my grandpa. I'm Edward the Third. Okay, so you're the third. So, tell us about your father. My father was a well. He, he was a lumber salesman, and uh, he was uh, born in Chicago, and. Uh, he got diabetes when he was about 13, 14 years old and had to take two shots a day for the rest of his life. And uh, he died when he was 46. He was a, he had a great sense of humor. People often ask, uh, where did the humor come from in our family? And I always say, it came from the dinner table. And all of us trying to make my dad laugh. And my dad was like Bob Newhart. He had a dry wit, and he, he knew every joke. He actually had met Bob Newhart a few times. And my mom was uh, like Edith Bunker. She had this high-pitched voice to get us up to school in the morning. And she was a very special lady with nine kids in her family. And uh, when Dad died at 46, left Mom with a handful. So, Would you say that your mother was kind of the foundation of the family? She definitely was. I mean, she... What she accomplished in those uh, last 20-some years, I was actually in the Air Force when my dad died. And my sister, one of my sisters was in the convent, and we have nine kids. And the other seven, it was up to mom to, to take care of them. And uh, she, ended up, she ended up getting a job when she was, well, let's see, she was like 46 years old, first time she had worked other than being a mom. And she worked at American Hospital Supply. And she would come in at 7.30 every morning and work the switchboard for an hour and a half to people calling in sick or whatever, employees. And this was in Evanston, Illinois. And then she would go to the mail room from uh, 9 to 11 and deliver the mail throughout the building, got to know everybody in the building. And then at 11 o'clock, she, worked, she went to lunch for half an hour, and then she worked in the cafeteria from 11.30 to 1 as a cashier. And then she, knew, she talked to everybody in the building. And then at one, she went back to the mail room for an hour. And by two, she was on her way home to be home when the kids got home from school. And she did that for 17 years. And uh, she was the Foster McGraw, who was the chairman of the company, told me, we look forward to her appearance every year at the stockholders meeting because she always had something she wanted to contribute to the company, some complaining about what we could do better. It was always the highlight of the meeting because she, she, everybody loved her and she made everybody laugh. And she said, why are we wasting money on this? Why, why can't we do better on that? And, and uh, so she was, she, and she only has like, you know, when you call your name out of the stock, you tell how many shares you have. And she would say, Lucille Murray, 11 shares. Now, when are we going to get this fixed? And, or the, the big shares didn't have anything to contribute. But she she was the heart of the soul of the family and definitely where a lot of the humor came from. And you have a lot of brothers. What was it like, and sisters, I might add, what was it like being the oldest of so many brothers? Well, I guess I, I had to do things first. Uh, so if I did something wrong, uh, they had to set an example for the rest of the brothers and sisters. If I did something good, that was supposed to be an example. Well, your brother was able to do this. You know. But there were eight of them, and... Uh, you know, the, the dinner table, as I mentioned, was a floor show every night, and then we, we argued for an hour after dinner who was going to do the dishes. And we, we, we used to watch a lot of TV together. We didn't have big vacations or things like that. And, uh, my dad would take us on trips to Chicago for a vacation all the way from Wilmette, Illinois, 10 miles away. We, we got to see things like the garage of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and uh, the Biograph Theater, where John Dillinger was killed. And my dad would he can always uh, show us the history of Chicago and take us to interesting places, but uh, not too often you could get nine kids in a car and go on vacation. What do you think about Chicago as a city? I love Chicago. 
It's a, I think it's a beautiful city. I guess fortunately or unfortunately, it's the most segregated city in the United States in that there's all these, I don't know how many wards there are in Chicago, but every ward's like a different kingdom. And you have the Irish ward and the Jewish ward and the Greek ward and the black ward and the Puerto Rican ward. And all these people came to Chicago, ended up settling with their own people. And it's still pretty much that way. And unfortunately, with all the violence that's going on in Chicago, for, for, unfortunately, there's violence. Fortunately, it's happening in only a couple of awards where the, the crime seems to be really bad. Whereas the downtown area, the Irish area, the Greek town, a lot of the others have none of that. And so it's still a relatively safe city in, in 95% of the, you know, the community. So, But Chicago has so much to offer. There's so much culture there. The sports is phenomenal. I, I just love the city. You just mentioned sports, and everyone in Chicago had this ex- incredible historical experience recently with the Cubs. It was unbelievable. I was an usher uh, high school and college. I worked for a company called Andy Frame, and my first job at Andy Frame was the White Sox World Series in 1959. But then working for Frayne, I would work both teams. I would, And I also worked for the Bears and the Bulls and the Blackhawks as an usher. And so, you know, I saw him suffer over the years and get close so many times. And I loved Ernie Banks and Ron Santo and those guys. And this last, and my younger brothers became really big Cub fans. And uh, they, uh, you know, this year was just unreal. And as a matter of fact, going back to my mom for a second, if I may, we're convinced that she had something to do with their, their victory this year. She went to the first night game the Cubs played back in 1988 with Joyce Sloan, who was the head of Second City Theater, was her best friend. And they sat about five rows behind the dugout, and that night it poured and poured and poured, and they didn't play the game. And the players were out running around the, the tarp field and sliding into second and third in the wet tarp and having fun. And my mom told the reporter, God did not mean for the Cubs to play night baseball. <laughs> so in the ninth inning of the seventh game, when the clubs, Cubs were blowing the lead they had, they'd come back from being down 3-1, to one, they're blowing the lead, and all of a sudden it starts raining. And my brothers and sisters, we were all texting each other back and forth, and I said, Mom is calling for a timeout. And sure enough, this, <laughs> this Hayward guy on the Cubs who hadn't done anything all year pulled the team together, and they had a team meeting and said, we're not going to give this up. These fans deserve this championship and they went back out on the field and took the game back and won the, the World Series. So we were going, way to go, Mom. So that was sort of fun between us. Hmm. We're talking with Ed Murray. Tell us about your brother, Brian Doyle Murray. How did the family react when he wanted to go into the world of show business? Well, what happened actually was when my dad died. Brian was going to school at St. Mary's College in Moraga, California. And he said, well, he was going to quit school and go back to go to work and help mom take care of the family. And uh, he had a job for a while as a peanut broker, and that didn't work out too well. But then he was hanging around Second City Theater, and he got involved in the, the workshop there and then the touring company there. And he was making like about 100 bucks a week, so he really wasn't supporting the family. But all of a sudden, you know, as he, he moved up in Second City into the regular company, he's there with Carol Ramos and Belushi and Jim Thomas and uh, Gilda and all these interesting people. And uh, so we all started to really enjoy it. And, of course, we always took Mom down to, to see the shows. And all those people I just mentioned were so nice and kind to my mom. Uh, I'll never forget that. But uh, Brian, you know, doesn't get the credit he deserves a, Everybody thinks that Billy is the big star of the family. But, but it was Brian who was the actor first four years before Billy went to Second City. And he had done a bunch of different things. And then when uh, he, went to, he went to New York and the Lampoon show with Billy and uh, Gilda and, and John Belushi and Paul Schaefer, he uh, started working on this script for Caddyshack. And at the same time, 
Saturday Night Live show was starting, and Chevy Chase was only on the show a year, and when he quit the show, they offered the, the role to, to uh, Brian. And Brian said, I'm busy doing this script. Why don't you consider my brother, Billy? So Billy got on, and he, Billy became very successful, and, and eventually Brian joined the show as a writer and an actor, and he was the anchor man on the news also. But people said, well, Bill Murray got his brother Brian a job on the show, when the truth is just the opposite. But uh, we're very proud of Brian. Brian's, Brian's done more shows, TV shows and movies, then Billy, and then Joel, and Johnny, I mean, combined, I think. So he's a very hardworking, busy actor, and we all get a kick out of his grumpy, gravelly voice. <laughs> he does have a very distinctive voice. Yeah, he, I have some nieces that came up to him one time when he was here and said, are you really the Flying Dutchman from SpongeBob? And he said, get away from your rotten kids. And then <laughs> they screamed and ran away. <laughs> But uh, he's the voice of the, sponge, of the character on SpongeBob, among many other. What is he like? Who? What is Brian Doyle Murray like? He's very um, serious. He's, he's soft-spoken. When he talks, it's like the old commercial. Pe- people listen because he usually has something to say, and uh, he's got a, he's just got a great wit. He's a kind person, a generous person, but, but he's pretty private. So your mother was supportive of this idea to go into entertainment. Oh yeah, and she she enjoyed going to the shows, and I mean there was humor was a big part of our family, so she would she would support that completely. It's interesting to me that all of the brothers are kind of involved in some way in something artistic, either acting, writing, or culinary. You know, as far as being a chef. And you went into more of a direction of finance, numbers, that kind of thing. Well, I had a job. <laughs> I got you. Um, the others uh, had uh, careers or hobbies. I, I had a job that made money. So I was a little different. But I did a couple creative things in my day. So I, I still do, actually. But th- back when I owned the radio station in Santa Maria, I had for two years a St. Patrick's Day parade on the radio, but there was no parade. <laughs> and uh, we won the award one year for the n- number one radio promotion in America. So Santa Maria radio station. And it was two hours long. And we sold 33 floats in the parade to sponsors that were very creative. And then we had, we had a lot of different people. Um, oh, what was the guy from the laughing? Um, put his hand over his ear all the time. Uh, oh. He was in, a, in the parade because he had been in San Maria for something. And, and then we had Ronald Reagan lives here or lived here and, and we took a speech he did and we turned it into like he was in the parade and we were asking him questions. He was answering our questions. And we had a lot of different, you know, celebrities and people in the parade and it was pretty funny. We had a lady call up and said, all right, where's the damn parade? I've been driving around this damn town for two hours, and I can't find the parade. And we told her there wasn't any parade. She swore at us, and it was really a lot of fun. And then since then, I've been, I'm have i involved in the First Tee Golf Program, uh, which is a a great program for, for kids. And uh, we have every year the no-show golf tournament. And for $100, you cannot play in our tournament. Or we ask you not to come. <laughs> and uh, there's a bunch of one, one-liners that my brothers help. Say you don't have to take a day off from work or retirement. There's no auctions. You, you can disregard bad weather. Right? You can be old or young or surgically impaired and still play. And matter of fact, we had one guy who bought a foursome in the tournament for three of his dead friends that he used to play golf with and himself. Huh. And when we the prizes are real, we give really, really good prizes. And he won. He won a first prize for three dead guys and himself. So um, it's called the No Show Golf Tournament, and it's sponsored every year by Murray Brothers Caddyshack, and we pay for the blimp. So that's <laughs> sort of it. And this is about the seventh. I'm working on it right now. It's about the seventh year we've had it, and we've had people all over the country copy it. As a matter of fact, one 
lady has a no-show Christmas dance party where you don't have to buy a dress, you don't have to get a babysitter, you don't have to worry about a DUI. You know, just <laughs> give us you, you, everyone can say, here's a hundred dollars, go away, I don't want to go. Well, that's what they can do <laughs> in our tournament. So I, I do some fun things. I also MC a lot of dinners, probably 20 a year in Santa Maria. And that goes back to the Celebrity Golf Tournament I had back in 1980 as the MC, and that evolved into other boys clubs and girls clubs and Chamber of Commerce dinners and cost a quarter point special advocates, which my wife and I are, uh, dinners. And so I do some creative things. You mentioned the radio station. Tell us about that. Well, let's see, when I was in college, I worked in the summers at a radio station in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and my goal was to uh, someday own my own radio station. And I went to Northwestern University, and I re- started in radio and TV and ended up in journalism. But um, So that was my background. I also did some time in the Armed Forces Radio and the Air Force. So the um, radio station, KSMA, in Sunny Country, I put the Sunny Country on the air. It wasn't even on the air. It's still the number one station in Santa Maria. And the AM is the number one AM news station in Santa Maria. And uh, mm-hmm. so we, we try to make it creative and involved in the community. And uh, I think we did a good job of that. It was, you know, my goal was eventually to have my own radio station, and I did, and then eventually sold it. And so the format was news, talk, that kind of thing? AM was news and talk in sports. We carried the the Rams, which are now back in Los Angeles, and UCLA, and then some of the local college and high school games. And then all, you know, we had... We won the, also won the Golden Mic Award in California for the best mid-market radio uh, news format, which we actually stole from the, uh, CBS, a guy named Norman Woodruff, who started the CBS news format that you hear, like in um, all these CBS O and O stations. We had the same format with the same sounders and news. You know, you know, we'd have business at 20 and 50 and sports at 10 and 40 and, you know, traffic and weather every 15 minutes and, and this guy Woodruff came to our station and trained our people how to do it, just like the big guys did it. And I knew him from when I worked at WBPM TV in Chicago. So that's uh, that was sort of fun creating something real, real quality radio station. You live in Santa Maria, and how long have you been there? Since 1980. Okay, and it seems like that's a, a big part of your life, the community there. Yes. What kind of place is Santa Maria? Well, Santa Maria right now it has about 150,000 people. It's uh, very ag-related. Our biggest crops are strawberries and grapes. We do all the green stuff, too, the lettuce and broccoli and cabbage and so forth. We have probably 40% of our population is Hispanic, mainly due to agriculture. It's a valley that once was part of the bay, so... Deep in inland, 20 miles inland, you'll find skeletons of whales and things like that once in a while. It's the most giving town I've ever seen as far as charity goes. People get really involved in giving back to the community and taking care of the poor people in town. And there's a, more millionaires here than anybody would ever guess. Some of the, you know, my fellow stockbrokers from Morgan Stanley from Beverly Hills would say, how can you do that much business in a little farm town? Well, you know, the, the best clients I had left the most dirt on my floor when they came in to drop off their money, <laughs> and they were they were farmers. So but that, it's, a, it's right halfway up the coast. If you look at the map of California, you see how the state bends at one point. That's Point Conception, and Vandenberg Air Force Base is there. That's about 20 miles south of us. And that's where they were. They were going to shoot the shuttle off until the shuttle program was canceled. But they still shoot rockets off all the time. They just did one last week that was shot up, and then they came back and landed on a barge in the ocean, which is it's going to be amazing if they do that on a regular basis. And you mentioned the Morgan Stanley. That was the, the company you were with. 
when I saw the radio station, I had part of the format, the news format, was uh, having stock stockbrokers. And I put two different stockbrokers from two different firms on the radio every day. And when I sold the station, both of them asked me if I'd like to come work for them. And one of them was Dean Witter. And that's who I went to work for in 1984. And Dean Witter was in 1994, I think it was, was bought by uh, Morgan Stanley or merged with Morgan Stanley. So I stayed really with the same company all those years, 27 years. What was the experience of being involved in stocks and finance? What is that like from your perspective? Well, I learned something from a guy when it was early in my career. And people would say to you, you know, I lost my ass or butt in the stock market. You know, I lost money in grapes or I lost money in real estate. And this guy's answer was always, what was your strategy? Well, to make a lot of money. When? Well, tomorrow. So you're telling me you don't have a strategy. <laughs> and I would use the same line with every client, client especially. So let's develop a strategy and let's develop a plan and then we stick with it. And so we would have a diversification of a portfolio, a certain percentage of bonds, and large cap stocks, small cap stocks, international stocks, and put the portfolio together. And the same kind of format that I would use for a hospital foundation or a school foundation would be for you personally, for your IRA, or for me personally, for my retirement plan. And we stay with it, and we don't change just because the market, right now the market's real hot, and people are nervous, so they want to get out. So then when it goes down, then they'll get back in. But they don't. They they usually miss the next upturn. But if they just leave it alone but have a realistic percentage in their portfolio and have a strategy, that's the key word, uh, they'll do all right. So that was that was pretty simple. And I wasn't a stock picker. I wasn't a guy who was going to call you up and say, i got this great stock for you. But I, I, I was good at picking good managers. And these managers would pick the stocks. So you might not, your portfolio might have seven or eight different managers. One's managing long-term bonds and another one short-term bonds, another one international, merging markets, and so forth. So that's sort of how I did it. And now my son and daughter-in-law, who became partners with me for eight years before I retired, have been running it for another seven years since I retired. And they also are doing a lot of the other things that I did they, my son's president of the Chamber of Commerce was was president of the Boys and Girls Club board. He's the club champion of the golf course. So they, they've gotten involved in the community. I'm really proud of that. I know there might be some people listening to this interview, and they're thinking, gosh, all this stuff, I, finance, that's just not for me. That's not I, – I don't know how to do that. Or A lot of people, they are afraid. What would you say to those people who say, I, I don't know? Well, I never thought finance was for me. I mean, if you, when I went to college, I wanted to be the broadcaster for the Cubs and Sox. Uh, my goal was in the broadcasting business. And the only reason I, I ended up in stock market business or brokerage business was because after I, when I sold the stations, I was divorced and I had three sons here. I had a friend who was the president of CBS Radio in New York wanted me to come to New York and be the vice president of CBS Radio, and I would eventually become president. But I didn't want to leave my sons. So I had to find something else to do. When I went to work at Martin Dean Witter, I figured I'd be there a year or two. And I had no idea I would still be there 27 years. But for anybody else, as far as getting in the business, it's a tough business to be in. Uh, not because of how the market goes up and down, but your success depends on how many clients you have and how much business they do. You're, you've got to have the right you know, the kind of personality and have to attract people and have people trust you. And uh, that's where all those years of being an MC, people got to know who I was in in a likable way, and they figured, well, I don't I don't know anything about the stock market. But this guy seems like a decent guy. Maybe someday if I ever have any money, I'll go talk to him. And uh, Or if a friend in the family has some money or somebody wins a lottery or whatever, or they're, they're retiring and getting their rollover, 
who am I going to talk to? Well, I'm the only stockbroker I know in town is Murray. <laughs> you see him at the boys club dinner every year. So maybe I'll go talk to him. So that's sort of how it, it evolved. And the other good thing that happened for me in that respect, back in 84, 5, 6, everybody had to have an IRA. And an IRA, you know, $2,000. And you certainly didn't make any money as a broker. But the market, those first three, four years I was in the business before the 87 crash, went straight up. So if somebody put $2,000 in a, in a stock mutual fund and went up 30%, they would think that was pretty good. And they said, well, can I put some more money in my IRA? I said, you can only, you can only put in 2000 but if you want to set, open a separate account for yourself, you can put 100000 if you want. And they did. So that was lucky that the first two years I was in the business, the market smiled for me. For anyone who's listening in, what financial advice would you give to just anybody? Have a strategy. Have a strategy. Stick with it. Yeah, and 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 start with starts if you have no, you know, not a whole lot of money. Just start with a a, a small IRA. The IRA should, is your retirement money. You should start with that first. But and take the same strategy whether you're talking about ten thousand or a hundred thousand or a million. Have a certain percentage that's in fixed income bonds that you know aren't going to hurt you. They may not make you any money a lot of years, but they're not going to hurt you. And then start. Building your, you know, if you're 25 years old, you should have a portfolio. We used to take a person's age and say, if you're 25, 25% of your money should be in bonds, 75% should be in stock. If you're 50, 50% should be in bonds, 50 should be in stock. If you're 75, you want 75% of your money in bonds and 25% stock. You see where I'm going? It gets older. You, the older you go, the safer you get with the money. So. But that that would be your strategy, and you might say, you know, I mean, I'm not going to go to Warren Buffett and tell Warren Buffett that he should have 85 percent of his money in bonds because he's 85 years old. He's going to say, I'm putting it all in stocks. But that's what he does for a living. That's I mean, that's just that's what's made him all that money, and he can handle the risk. We're talking with Ed Murray of the Murray Brothers. There's this restaurant in St. Augustine, Florida, the Murray Brothers. Tell us, what was it like to open a restaurant? Well, I'm really at a distance. I'm as far away as you can get from the restaurant, which is in St. Augustine. It was fun. And Brian had a great line once. He, after we opened it up, he says, oh, let me get this straight. We can eat and drink and play golf for free. Why didn't we think of this years ago? <laughs> so that's that's about, you know, it was really fun that anybody goes there. The memorabilia on the wall is fabulous because it's got the whole family so many different ways and, and a lot of the history of golf on the wall. And I just got a call from somebody the other day I went to high school with I haven't talked to in 60, 50 years. And they went to the restaurant in St. Augustine and saw all the pictures and called me up and told me what a good time they had. So I wish you would have called me earlier. I would have bought your lunch, but uh, I didn't didn't know that they were. I didn't even know they were still alive for that matter. But it really is fun when we go there, and then we have our tournament every year in March, and uh, we raise a lot of money for uh, first responders and we the St. Vincent's Hospital. We do a lot for them too. That's fun too, and the people who come to the play in the golf tournament also come to the parties and the, the two evenings, and there's an auction where we auction off the bill he gets auctioned off and a lot of other things, charity and memorabilia and stuff like that gets auctioned off. Andy is the key to the restaurant as far as he was a chef. He knows the food business and he understands, you know, how to run it. And we have a lot of other good people. And we're looking at maybe opening another one in the, in the Chicago area sometime in the next year. What do you recommend somebody get from the menu? Well, everything is on there. I mean, of course, there's there's some things like Sheboygan bratwurst and Chicago hot dogs and Chicago beef sandwiches. But then there'll, there'll be fish items. There'll be, what do they call it, uh, Chinese chicken salad or whatever, you know, things like that. There'll be things you wouldn't expect on the menu. The best thing on the menu is the decadent dessert, which is a hot fudge sundae 
that they pour the fudge on it from five feet over the place, so it splatters all over the place. <laughs> that's, that's that's a real fun dessert. But you can get anything. You can get just salads if you want. You can have fish. You can have chicken. It's an all-American menu. When people know that you're the brother of Bill Murray, Brian Doyle Murray, Joel Murray, what kind of what kind of reaction do people have, and what is that like for you? Is it annoying? Uh, is it what is no, it? no. But I do let them know that that they're my brother. I was born first, so when they say you're Bill Murray's brother, I say no, he's my brother. No, everybody asks a lot of questions. When's he coming to town? Until we get to meet him. And we were just at Pebble Beach for the last week. Uh, Billy and Joel and I, Billy played in the tournament. My wife, Lisa, and I go up every year and watch him play. And we have a bunch of friends that we go to dinner with. And this year was the first year Joel's been up there a long time. And he walked the fairways with Billy. And Billy made the cut, which was a lot of fun. What was really fun is walking with the crowd and hearing all the things people say about him. They don't know who I am. They don't know I'm, I'm there. But we get to hear it. And the people really love him. I mean, old people and young kids and people of all ages. And he's so good with the crowd. I'm very proud of him. I mean, he handles the situation very well. And uh, I'm proud to be his brother. I'm proud to have him as my brother. <laughs> There's this photo I was telling you, or I was the listeners rather, about the article that came out about you in the Santa Maria Times. And there's a picture of you and your wife and your your volunteers for this organization, CASA. And that's what the article's about. Anybody can look that up online. How did you meet your wife? Well, she she was born and raised in Santa Maria. It's funny she's. She was married before her husband was still in a car accident, and uh, I was divorced and single, and uh, she actually lived down the street from me. But I sort of I knew her ex-husband. He had, had an account with me at one time. He was in the ag business. And so that's sort of how I, I first met her. Her family is half Italian, half Mexican, and ours is 100% Irish. And so we didn't have a single designated driver at the wedding. <laughs> but she's she's from a wonderful family. She has three sisters. Going back to that story about the casa, I was emceeing the casa's annual dinner for a couple of years, and then I asked her if she wanted to go to the dinner with me and sit at the table with me, and she said sure. And the speaker that year was a young girl who was home on her second from her second duty in Iraq as a marine. And she had been, her mother was a prostitute and was a meth junkie. And uh, she was uh, disappeared. And then she she was taken away by the court, taken away from her mother. And she had a, you know, she had a social worker and she had a therapist and all the other things you get when you're taken away from your home. But she also had a CASA assigned to her. And it was a lady who had to see her every week. And, you know, look out for her and visit her schools and talk to the therapists and teachers and whatever. And she had this lady from the time she was 12 until she went into service when she was 18. And her mother ended up dying in a sleazy motel here in Santa Maria. So she was telling this whole story, and Lisa's crying listening to the story. Next thing you know, Lisa wants to be a CASA, court-appointed special advocate. And the judge appoints you to assist uh, these kids. And it's, it's interesting that you're talking about this week because last night I was with my two Casa boys, two brothers that I've had for three years, and we went to batting cage, and then we went and had dinner. But on Tuesday, we're going to court where they are going to be turned over to their adoptive parents. They are being adopted after these years. It's two boys and a and their sister, and Lisa is the casa for the sister, and I'm the casa for the two boys, and they're going to have a full-time family adoption Tuesday, which is the ultimate goal of a casa with the foster kids. And these are good kids from bad situations, and so we're real proud of, of that. And this Lisa's had like five or six families. I've had four, 
and uh, we'll we'll get another one in another month or so. Every town has a court appointed special advocate program, so if people are listening and are interested, uh, it can be used. Believe me. What is the best thing about being Ed Murray? Oh, I think my family and friends. There's so much diversity. There's so many interesting characters that come through our lives. Our family, as you can hear, is really different <laughs> and interesting. I think that the example that my mom and dad set as far as being charitable and helping people is passed on to all nine kids and all and the grandkids and the great grandkids. I think it's just very proud to be part of this family. And I forgot to mention I have three sons too that I'm very proud of. Two of whom are golf pros. So. All right. I'm going to give you the stage for anyone who's listening to us. You can say anything you want. What would you say to the listeners? About what? I mean, anything. Well, I think what I just said about the example that of giving. My mom always said, "You always get back more than you give." And whether it's uh, working on a different charity. You, the one thing I said in the, the a couple of awards I won on Citizen of the Year and the philanthropy thing with my wife is that you can really make a difference, especially in, in a smaller town like this. A person can make a difference by getting involved in a, a charitable board or a little league team or a golf first tee program, especially where there's kids involved. You can make a difference. It does. You don't have to give a lot of money. You don't have to be real rich. There's lots of things you can do in your community, and you'll feel it. You'll feel it back that you you made a difference. So I think that that's sort of been a goal of Lisa's and mine is that we can make a difference. My last question: Who is Ed Murray? You know, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> heard some of your inter- other interviews and you always ask that. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I would say that the best thing I can say is he, he's a lot of people. He does a lot of things seriously and a lot of things for fun. He tries to make, like in, one, in my role as an MC, make the program or the dinner or whatever go better and be funnier in no-show golf tournaments and on no-show parades and things like that. It, I try to bring a sense of humor into it. I'm not a professional comedian like some of the members of my family, but I've, I've gotten that sense of humor from my mom and dad. I think we all have. So I think, you know, I'm basically a good person from a good, great family and uh, try to do the best I can to make a difference. Mr. Murray, thank you very much for coming on this show. Well, thank you for having me, and best of luck to you and your listeners. Thank you. Godspeed.